Welcome to Electro Technology Cognitive Toolbox Skills for Learning Electrical Physics by Dr. Kenneth Meyer and it's Dr. Ken here narrating this introduction for you. So the toolbox has 17 tools. So let's quickly go through each one of the tools just to give you some idea of uh, what it's about. So the first one is a little bit about non-sensory physics, that is electrotechnology. You can't see, hear, touch, taste or smell electricity and that's going to present some issues in learning. Then with number two we're going to look at uh, active listening skills, how we can improve our listening, particularly since this is a series of videos and active listening is going to play an important part. How history, number three, can help us learn in electrotechnology. Um, four, a little bit about mathematics and its role that it plays in learning of electrotechnology, remembering that mathematics is only a modelling system itself, an abstraction to deal with an abstraction. Number five uh, is distractions. You can see the picture of a phone there. Uh, our phones can be great tools, but they can also be great distractions as well as other things. Number six is connectivism. Um, a fellow by the name of George Siemens is big into connectivism and it's all about how we often connect things at a shallow level to start with and then dig down deeper later on. Then we've got uh, number seven, meaning not memory. So to learn something is to make meaning. So we're going to talk about some skills where we can move from memory to meaning. Number eight is all about mental modelling because we can't see, hear, touch or taste or smell electricity. We have to use some mental modelling skills to be able to represent what the physics is doing and that's what that one's about. Number nine, imagination. Uh, to be able to have any of the 17 skills, we've got to have strong imagination skills and that's what many of these cognitive toolbox skills are. Then number 10, metacognition. Meta just means above or beyond cognition. In other words, it's a fancy name for learning how to learn or how to manage your own learning, number 10. Number 11, calculated risks. There's risks in learning and how to cope with those risks. Number 12, problem solving. There are several approaches to problem solving skills that can help us in electrotechnology. Number 13 is continuous learning. That uh, even as you might be an apprentice at the moment, learning will go on all through your trade. Number 14, thinking interdependently. So quite often we often don't realise that we actually have to learn in and with others and we can take advantage of learning interdependently. Number 15, reading between the lines. Being able to see more than what's just written on the page or what's presented in the video. So a bit of skill there. And then 16, underpinning knowledge in electrotechnology. We start with WHS, some DC, the layers build up. So underpinning knowledge is very, very important. And then finally, reflection and awe and understanding that electrotechnology and electrical energy is a phenomenon that is absolutely astounding and we should stand in awe that we will never fully understand the phenomenon. We certainly cannot define it, but we do know how to manage and use it. So those are our 17 cognitive tools that will help you in electrotechnology. So I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction. Um, my name of, is Dr. Ken Meyer and uh, I've been involved in electrical trades since, uh, to, well teaching it since 1994 through to 96. Then I started teaching electrical engineering from 97 to 2005 and again I've been an electrical teacher now full time since 1998 to uh, right about now in late 2018 as it happens to be. So a bit of a warning, I'm a dyslexic that hates reading so I'm trying to keep to a minimum and that's why this is a series of videos rather than a book. So let's get this issue sorted up front. I am a dyslexic that like dislikes intensely reading. On top of that, I'm an Australian male that only reads the instructions when all else fails. The problem is 
that the only efficient way to communicate to many people quickly is through writing and reading and making of videos, this kind of thing. Remember, if you've got this far with my little video series, uh, you only have to read and listen to it. I've had to read it, write it, narrate it, and uh, live it inside and out. So I hope you enjoy the video series and uh, learning a little bit more about myself and electrotechnology specifically. So how do these instructions work? Um, this uh, plastic model kit instructions you can see, who needs them? Depends on how many kits that you've actually made in the past. And uh, in my past childhood, I have made hundreds of plastic aeroplane kits. So this video is like the instructions to putting a model kit together. But to do this, I'm going to tell you a story. The story is of a very green, timid electrical apprentice that started their apprenticeship back in 1974, moving from country New South Wales to the big smoke to Sydney. In the story, I will explain how the video works, how to navigate through it. Yes, you don't have to read and watch absolutely everything and how you can amplify your learning electrotechnology. So that timid electrical apprentice was me, of course. So the story starts in a little country town called Tumut in the Snowy Mountains. And let's say it's about 1969. Black and white TV, if you had one, there were no calculators, no computers, almost no phones, well, only if you could afford one, and certainly no internet. Major industries were and still are today farming, two small mills, and a pine board factory. For someone who, by year seven, could not hardly read, this was an absolute nightmare. By God's grace, two school subjects collided and the two were very helpful and relationships were formed between them. So in this video I have made an effort to keep the reading to a minimum and keep the language as direct as I possibly can. If an aspect of the video is of extreme importance, um, which most of it is, I have used some symbols and icons to help and give you a hint about what is worthy and what's you should make an effort to uh, spend a bit more time on. So, okay, on with the story. The two subjects collided were maths and science. The two relationships were my maths tutor, Margaret, and my youth group leader, Bob, who was a mature age electrical apprentice himself. In year seven, I discovered the language of maths actually algebra and this was easier to read and understand rather than English particularly spelling and if it were not for the computers and spell correction this story would be unreadable. I am still not to this day I'm sorry I am to this day still pretty rubbish at spelling so this easier reading of algebra only uses a few symbols and operators to understand not the 26 symbols and infinite complexity and rules and non-rules that make no sense to me in English. With the encouragement of Margaret, I soon found algebra helpful in science, particularly physics. By the way, biology is not a real science in my opinion. At the same time, as I was getting into real science, physics, Bob was finishing his apprenticeship and we were having great conversations around electrical stuff. Bob began giving me old lamps, buttons, relays to play with. It was not long before I was hounding my parents for batteries and started to experiment. I think the sales of D cells quadrupled over that period in tumour. So in a sense my dyslexia was a blessing causing me to learn a different language that was easier to learn because it was more consistent than English, and that was science. 
As a result, I got through U10, or what is called, was called fourth form in my day, quite well with everything in advanced pass, well, everything except English. I think I was given a past, lowest possible grade, apart from a fail, in English out of sympathy. At the end of what is now 1973, my dad encouraged me with the school council, the principal, my aunts, my grandparents, you can sense the pressure, to apply for some apprenticeships in the electrical field. This was all supported by the Vocational Guidance Bureau in Wagga Wagga in New South Wales. And uh, this is kind of what they say in 1973 about, uh, about me, and I quote, the available evidence from the aptitude, ability and interest tests when considered in conjunction with the reports of educational progress suggests an apprenticeship in a skilled trade based on fourth form or year 10 level would be the best point to begin your career. An objective interest analysis which reveals a preference for those occupations classified as scientific artistic design lends strong support to the choice of an electrical fitter mechanic. The radio and television trades would appear to also offer a suitable alternative. So, at 17 I applied for four apprenticeships. Even though, quietly, I wanted to continue with high school, but that's another story. An electrician at Pineboard in Tumut, Department of Civil Aviation, Sydney as an electrician, CSR as an electrician, and finally an avionics ground engineer with Qantas were the ones that I applied for. In the end, I got job offers for all of them. I'm sure you're itching to know which I took. Well, I went with CSR, but probably not for the reasons that you may be thinking. I was very timid country boy in the big city, and this was very stressful. Civil Aviation and Qantas were at Kingsford Smith Airport, three buses and one train ride away from Willoughby, where my grandparents lived. So I simply discounted those. Pineboard and Tumut were too close to home. That simply left CSR Piermont at the easiest to get to. So that is the one that I took. Simple pragmatic logistics. At least it was a factory. I was attracted to industrial electrical work because of my friend Bob. And you can see some pictures there of the CSR factory in the early 1970s. And I spent many, many hours fixing the packaging machines, the cranes, the conveyor systems, the boilers, all of those kinds of things are very heavily industrialized part of my apprenticeship. The next four years went past quickly, working for CSR, attending North Sydney TAFE. Sadly, electrotechnology is no longer taught there. The electrical physics gelled with me well, and so in the second year of my apprenticeship, I began my electrical engineering certificate. I completed some 20 years later after getting married and having three kids. By then, it had become an advanced diploma. More of that later. I was fortunate that CSR provided a wide range of learning experiences. As a large sugar refinery, they produced their own electricity, rewound their own motors, had large engineering workshops, and were leaders in electronics, particularly industrial electronics, which we called being an electrician special class in those days. Today it's called a Certificate 4. Then, on top of this industrial instrumentation and design drawing office, each apprentice got to spend six months in each of these departments. For me, the experience seemed to be in problem solving. Probably helped from my days in Scouts. On completion of my apprenticeship, I was made one of the shift electricians. The factory ran 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and I found myself repairing anything from turbine controls to packaging machine equipment, and lots and lots in between. And I certainly would uh, encourage any of you who are listening to this, never miss an opportunity 
to uh, learn how to problem solve, particularly in electrotechnology. So this skill comes from keeping your mind open to the possibilities, what I call imagination, and plenty of simple practice. Later in the video series, I will explain the role of imagination, and it also is a skill that you will need to develop. That when imagination is required, keep a lookout for this little icon of a light bulb and a twisted pencil, because it's not as straightforward as you think. There are twists and turns to learning how to problem solve. Before too long, an opportunity came along to work in the testing branch of Sydney Electricity. My industrial experience soon had, soon had me working with the, the testing branch in high voltage testing of transformers, buzz bars, industrial insulator systems, high voltage cables and things of the like, all the way up to what, 300 kV. To keep the uh, story shorter, my electrical career progressed through many jobs over the next 20 years. So finally ending up in Wagga Wagga, again, not far from Tumut and home, working for a large electrical contractor, doing industrial control supervision and factory automation. I also got involved with in-house training. It was this point my wife, who's also a school teacher, suggested that be good at this time to begin doing some uh, some training because I needed some new challenges. My local university, CSU or Charleston University, had a degree program in vocational education and training, which we abbreviate to VET. So I thought I would give it a go. But there was a problem. I couldn't read very well at all, let alone very quickly. So I only enrolled in one subject to see how I would cope. As soon as I got the uh, text list, I ordered the books and started to read as much as I could. Sometimes two or three times until it began to sink in, I hoped. Then when the study guide and additional readings arrived, I found myself reading some of the parts of the text again for the fourth time. But the risk had paid off. The pre-reading struggle had done two things for me. The sheer effort had improved my reading a little. Second, I had gained the bigger context and could see how the lecturer's readings fitted together. My first subject at university was a credit. I would have been happy with a pass. This was a technique I used for the rest of my university career. Get the texts early, read them all. Then, when the study guide comes, read it again as directed. I got plenty of passes and a few distinctions along the way, but achieved a degree and a master's this way. Long practice improved my reading and my spelling a little bit, but spelling will never be a good thing for me. Reading for me still takes lots of effort, but I've embraced the requirement and now derive some satisfaction from reading and sometimes even get a little bit of joy. As you'll soon discover, electrotechnology is a science with its own jargon and reading is a requirement for this course choice. From reading installation instructions or applying AS3000, that's the wiring rules, you will need reasonable reading skills. So back to the story so far. During my first degree, I needed to do some teaching practice as one of my university subjects. So I approached my local TAFE and was soon given a part-time teaching load in the evening classes. That was back in 1997 and I've been teaching for TAFE New South Wales ever since. So uh, don't have to do the maths. Yep, that's 20 years worth. 
Over that 20 years, I began to notice something about electrical students that grasped electrical concepts well and often easily. So I started to ask them about their interests and hobbies. I found anecdotally, sorry about the big word, this means it's something that seems to be connected, that these students played in local bands and were good at art and drawing. There seemed to be something creative, some creative thing going on in their general interests. I was also at this time considering doing a PhD and this gave me an idea I could run with. Again, the interests of saving you some time and reading effort or listening effort in this particular case. I will fast forward a few years. So in 2012, I was awarded a PhD in vocational education and training for my thesis entitled Imagination in the Learning of Electrical Physics. The question is now, how does that help you? Well, the rest of these cognitive toolbox skills is all about what I learned and how to learn and teach electrical physics. So I hope you've enjoyed a little bit of my story and I hope you get something out of our skills toolbox for learning in electrical physics. Don't forget, number one is non-sensory physics. Number two is active listening. Number three, it's important to understand some of the history of electrotechnology it does help your learning. Maths is just a modeling system. Use your phone as a tool, not a distraction. How we can use making quick connections become deeper. Remember number seven, it's about making meaning, not about remembering. And we're going to use some number eight mental modeling to achieve that. And it's all built around this picture of imagination skills number nine. Number 10, learning how to learn. Number 11, how to take some calculated risks in your learning. Number 12, some skills in problem solving. Number 13, some more skills and some ways you can go about doing continuous learning. Number 14, thinking independent, interdependently. That's learning with others. And then how to read between the lines. Number 16, make sure you don't data dump. When you learn something in electrotechnology, you will need it as an underpinning piece of learning for something else later on and then understand that you need to be able to reflect and stand in awe of the electro technology industry and energy that we live, work and play with. So thank you for listening and enjoy the Cognitive Toolbox.